the Netflix original series Stranger Things. This is episode 106, entitled The Monster. I'm Adam Foxman, this is Mathis Coos, and you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Reddit. We'd love to field any questions, comments, and concerns. Also, please, please rate us on iTunes. This is the number one way that you can support our show, and we'd really appreciate it. What is going on, Mathis? Not a whole lot. I'm pretty excited to to dive into this episode. We're getting ever closer to the end, and uh, shit's getting pretty real. But uh, before before we start, just a, a call out as a way to additionally support us, other than iTunes recognition and telling your friends, because right now that is really the most important thing to us. But um, if you have any interest of pursuing any of the media that we talk about throughout the episodes, uh, this episode's really brought on a sense of nostalgia. So we've you know, talked about all kinds of different movies. Uh, we try our best to recall everything we talked about and link it in the description. So it'll take you to a link for the Blu-ray on um, Amazon, in which case if you buy it, we get a little cut. So it's just a free way to support us as you were going to buy something else anyway. Um, but other than that, yeah, let's let's uh, you know get going. We start out with Jonathan now Wait, just yelling quick, in one the darkness. One other little thing I uh, wanted to throw out there. Oh, 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 oh God, oh, what? Oh. Um, is by the time this airs, we will have hit our thousandth listen. So thank you very much to everybody who has uh, repeatedly come back and listened to our episodes, even though we're recording Stranger Things ones weeks after it's come out, and pre- people probably binged and finished the whole thing. Um, so just thank you very much to everybody for coming back and, you know, as we're, uh, growing and kind of learning uh, the format on how we want to do this, we've had lots of discussions on with Netflix shows moving forward about how we want to really try to just, you know, hunker down and just do uh, like massive grouping of podcasts, like put together, you know, episode one, two, three, four, like the first day that some big shows come out. So Um, We're definitely going to learn and grow from the experiences, but we just, man, thank you so much to the listeners, uh, you know, who have tuned in, who are giving us feedback, uh, and and have just been really, uh, you know, kept us really interested in what we're doing here. Yeah, it's absolutely awesome to have uh, interaction with the audience, and we're hoping as the audience grows, we will get more and more of that, because... um, the more feedback we get, the better we can make the program, and, and we love hearing from you guys. So uh, let's now get going, right? Before I took the wind out of your sails, you were saying something along the lines of, it starts off with Jonathan? Yes, Jonathan looks into the formless void and calls out oh for God, Nancy. please don't do that. <laughs> no? Me out. It's seriously <laughs> tickling straight into my eardrums right now. And, uh, yeah, but no, he's it. yelling Nancy and the screen's black. Um, and then you actually see Nancy and the the weird like dark fucked up yeah zone. The shadow realm yeah whatever you want to call it right what is that what they call it veil of the shadow from the the rpg but yes. anyway you see her kind of faintly hearing his call in the distance so then she starts calling his name and then on the other end he's starting to hear her as well so yeah the echo of each other's voices are kind of passing through the void Mm-hmm. Uh, and at this point, the monster is pursuing her. She is uh, hidden behind a tree, trying to stay out of sight. And she's still hearing Jonathan. And then she notices to the tree to the right of her, she sees a little bit of that glowing amber ember uh, and decides to kind of wholeheartedly go for that before she's devoured. Yeah, you get some interesting little shots of the monster right here, too. Because, like, where she's got her back to one of the little... We're calling them trees, but they really don't... They, they look quite different on her end of the void. And uh, and so, yeah, she, she's got her back to it, and the monster's kind of going right behind her, and hey, you just could see it being one of these moments where she kind of looks out one side of the tree and it just pops up all scary in her face. But, no, she actually, you know, kind of ends up making a break for where she hears uh, his voice. Jonathan now has discovered the tree that has the little entrance to it and uh so he is like got his face right up to it and all of a sudden a hand pops out and like he jumps backwards definitely you as the audience are like (gasps) you know (gasps) big old gasp moment and uh so he grabs her hand and you're kind of half expecting it to be one of those things where like he goes to severed hand yeah or like you know as he's pulling it then you know on the other side the the monsters grabbed her foot or something but he does end up uh birthing her from this uh orifice here and bringing her into the world yeah so they finally um you know 
get back together where they've been separated in the past she for whatever reason like honestly if she died in this uh scene i would have just been like told you it was a dumb idea because that totally took me out of the show when she just decided to crawl through this you know weird open vaginal space in a tree oh i loved it because i was not really feeling their interactions together last episode and i thought oh well that's one way to deal with it <laughs> it's true <laughs> yeah. just, just throw her into the realm and, and make it a little more intriguing so yeah that was kind of our big complaint was their uh kind of dialogue not so much the chemistry I, I thought they played off each other well but more about what they actually had to say but um anyway the the place where she births from let's stay with the vaginal references it seals behind her uh it's very sinewy and then it kind of just becomes normal tree just like we've seen in the past where the wallpaper and the cement sealed up in Joyce's house um and and to your point earlier yeah everything in that realm just seems extra living and organic which basically means it looks like muscle and it's wet yeah I mean after the uh the gaping orifice closes again I mean uh it's it's real tight it's I mean obviously been doing its uh little kaggle exercises (laughs) <laughs> obviously, obviously. Um, okay let's uh let's move on from this because we could probably go all day long with the disgusting birthing metaphors but let's go to the boob tube buddies uh spotlight favorite character good old rape face steve harrington yeah so we've now gotten the credits we now know if you didn't research before we know the episode name is the monster which is very exciting just because we all love the monster scenes um so He's driving to go check in on Nancy and um, Tommy and what's the girl's name? Is it Carol? I literally every single time write down little buddies. So uh, thank you for reminding me that his name's Tommy. And no, I don't remember what her name is. All right. So Tommy and Carlita are in the car and they're in the ribbing Steve because, uh, you know, He's pining over Nancy, and they kind of think she's lame. And so he's now... Yeah, because he's like, you know, so- something's wrong with her. He's like, he's worried about her. And they're so douchey, like, oh, you're in love. Yeah, they're, they're being total douches. Like, once again, you're kind of getting the moment where they halfway want you to kind of come around to Steve as a character. Because he does have these tiny little glimpses of... Humanity. Humanity. And then everything else is, like, super poser douche uh and i will also reference this on our our twitter and all that but i saw another interesting article on stranger article on stranger things where they're referencing um all the cars used and only one of them is wait did you link this up this article up on our page this article is going to be up um super soon and uh I haven't put it up yet, but I will put Are it up. Are you super theorious? I'm super theorious. <laughs> and uh, the only car that's anachronistic and doesn't meet the 1983 timeline Wait, is... Wait, it's, it's what? Anachronistic. All right. Just, An- uh, anachronism. I mean, clearly, I know what that is, but will you tell all of our listeners out there what that is, you know, just for research purposes? Well, let's see if they get it from context. Instead of being a car from 1983 or before, it's from 1988. So it doesn't set doesn't make sense barb's car oh, okay but the other interesting facts is all the other cars are basically normal uh like family cars that people could afford and then um steve's bmw is way out of the price range of all the other cars oh that's interesting yeah super douche super douche but at this point um he climbs up his little you know his little route that he's formed to go into her room and he sees Jonathan and Nancy sitting on the bed, correct? Yeah. He's draping something over her shoulders, like, uh, you know, some comforting motion. And Steve is just in the window. Like, are you, are you fucking kidding me? Like she's going to leave this Adonis for that douchebag. Um, can you explain Adonis for the audience? (laughs) <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Steve puts on his rage face, and he's not happy. Uh, and then we now cut to um, Chief and, and Joyce, correct? Um, well, actually, uh, I wanted to kind of stay with the Nancy plot line just a little bit, just because, you know, st- even though it's in a different scene, it's still True. the same evening in there. And it, it's Nancy, uh, she's showering, and she's having terrible flashbacks of this monster um i mean just like on the verge of a panic attack remembering the different scenes with seeing the monster which i love every moment of this just because i want to see as many shots as possible with the monster and uh while she's in there jonathan's setting up his little makeshift bed on the floor next to hers and uh she wants him to to stay the night um and he lays down on the floor 
and then she invites him up to bed. Woo. Oh yeah, so we, <laughs> we get this kind of uh, gratuitous scene of her showering, uh, but she's having Vietnam flashbacks, and he calls her up to the bed, and you're almost like, oh shit, is she actually gonna cheat on Steve? But no, she's just kind of scared and wants him to to sleep next to her. So it's not quite it's not quite the. Uh, <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> uh, I swear I have like a massive soundboard and I'm waiting for you to basically tell me which one to do every now and then by accident. <laughs> <laughs> That's really fun. The no, only I'm reason nice when you interrupted me earlier that there wasn't a record scratch is somehow the soundboard didn't have that. See, this is why everybody needs to go and use those links that we're using uh, for Amazon because... I mean, man, we are going to invest that money into having even more high quality drops like the one you just heard that I'm sure blew your fucking mind. Oh man, such such a uh, such a moment, you know. Every episode, they're just <laughs> true, genuine, legitimate. It's it's the reason people tune in. So speaking of moments, it's the morning after Jonathan wakes up in bed. Nancy's already sitting up and uh, says she didn't sleep much because every time she closed her eyes, she saw the hideous monster and uh so she's they're, they're kind of pontificating about you know what's what makes it tick like what is what can they compare it to so that they can kind of start to understand its motives and uh you know how they can find it again and she thinks that it lives there and then talk about it feeding on the deer and how it only comes out at night and uh and then they're kind of talking about how uh, you know, Jonathan's sure that Barb and Will are alive because Joyce was speaking to Will. Um, and, and then they start to kind of compare it to different animals. Like, she has some book open. Um, yeah, so as they've kind of mentioned before uh, a few few times, Nancy's smart and she pays attention in school. So she's able to pull out National Geographic or some other encyclopedia uh, yeah, and start dropping like some knowledge. She's like the Hermione for any um, Harry Potter fans out there. She's like the Hermione of this show. Yes, uh, she's the Hermione of the show. So she drops some knowledge and it's like, hey, it's like this animal or that animal. Um, I think the only real thing that you need to take from it is that her theory is that it can detect blood. So the kind of like a yeah. shark or something else. Um, a shark, you know, can d detect one drop in whatever forty million or something. So that they have this crazy idea. I mean, I guess Nancy just loves doing dangerous stuff um, because now she's like, well, we can test it, right? And you know, he's like, how? So we'll see how that plays out. Yeah, and uh, before they can, you know, finish this conversation, all of a sudden the door handle starts jiggling, and it happens really loudly. Like again, I jumped a little bit. And uh, and it's the mom, you know, wondering why the the door's locked. And Nancy's like, uh, "I'll be down in a second. There's this awkward little pause. And Jonathan's like, "Your mom doesn't knock." And then they <laughs> laugh a little bit. And it was it was a funny little moment. I thought. Yeah, it was it was a good moment. And I unfortunately, like I know you guys were waiting, but I didn't have a door jiggle sound. <laughs> oh yeah you know i am sending you the notes ahead of time you should have all this prep. <laughs> although to be fair sometimes i send you the notes like five seconds before we start recording <laughs> so that might be a little bit of a burden on you as the sound engineer of the show well um i just so everyone knows i did order a three foot saw off of uh, amazon so i should be able to make some pretty realistic thunder sound soon Oh man, I can't wait. Uh, uh, good times. So downstairs at the house, Karen's gone back down. She's feeding little baby Holly, talking to the hubby, and uh, uh, so Karen, uh, which is Nancy and Mike's mom, goes back upstairs to get Nancy, and um, the door is locked. Uh, the music's playing. She, you know, she can't get in. She's not getting a response. So she uh, MacGyver's her way into the door with a bobby pin. She pulls out of her hair. And sees the window open, sees the makeshift bed on the floor. So, like, somebody obviously spent the night. She's now snuck out. So, she's wondering, you know, what the hell is going on. But we don't really find out. Like, we don't get to see her interacting, I don't think, uh, with Nancy during this episode. So, we don't get any sort of closure on on how this is going to play out between them. No, no, not at all. Do you recall what song was playing when she came in? Because it was a pretty good song. <clears throat> no, I, I didn't write it down. I really don't know. They need to come out with, like, not only the score, because the score is great, but a soundtrack, because they have enough, like, a lot of it feels like it's just The Clash, because that's the one that's kind of plot-specific. They are coming out with the soundtrack, right? Well, I think they're doing, in the soundtrack, they're, like, the score, like, it's all the original music for the show. 
Like even um, just a Spotify. I don't know. Maybe they're doing both. Yeah, I, th- I thought it was both, but I-, I guess I couldn't tell you that definitively. But we should probably not speak on things that we're not ironclad sure about. I guess so. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, what was with that awkward pause? Jesus, way to leave me hanging out there. <laughs> I was just trying to think how ironclad sure I was about any of the speculating I'm about to do throughout this episode. And then I was well, like, that's a good point. We're, screw we're, it. I mean, every, literally everything. That we're, you should just, yeah, leave that one hanging there. <laughs> okay. um, so, uh, Joyce and Sheriff are kind of going through the story. Like, Joyce wants to know. Uh, everything that happened when Sheriff broke into the Hawkins laboratory. And so he's talking about the room that he went into that had all the kids' drawings in it. Yeah, and she, um, it's like, wait, what drawing? He's like, well, oh, the drawings. You never said anything about a drawing. You know, what did the drawing look like? You know, typical kid drawing, you know, stick figures. Um, then it wasn't Will. What do you mean it wasn't Will? And she pulls out the Cabbage, uh, cabbage Wizard drawing from yes. prior episodes, which outside of the bad coloring was you know would win some awards if you're his age it's, it's very well done it was pretty good and you know yeah especially compared to him thinking that will would have been doing the stick figures that were in that terrible drawing that we saw earlier right yeah which by the way a said 11 artist. on it it did say 11 on it too oh i didn't even notice that yeah. so now he um immediately starts to put all the pieces together that he's missed but the audience knew he's yeah, kind of like kid that was at benny's like this was the kid that was in the facility and then he's thinking back towards uh when they were in the library uh a few episodes ago when they had just real quick kind of glossed over this article about this terry ives uh, who had claimed that her daughter had been taken by dr brenner and these scientists and um, he's kind of putting it all together like maybe Eleven is this missing child from that and, uh, and, yeah. and also the one that was at Benny's. And, and I'll say I don't want to sound greedy but I could have used a montage here because it seemed like some pretty heavy handed exposition where he just kind of pulls all the pieces out of thin air I could have seen him pacing back and uh, forth in front of like a cork board with pins or a whiteboard and kind of piecing out the evidence and then putting it all together but I don't know, he seemed to... We could have at least gotten, like, a memory montage. Yeah, because he seemed to literally put all these disparate elements apart and very quickly say, like, I think I've been chasing the wrong kid. So now yeah. he's on to there being a potentially escaped, um, you know, test subject of Papa. Yeah, so Sheriff ends up making a couple of calls and finds out where Terry Ives lives. So um, they get in the car, him and Joyce, and they drive to... This old house in the countryside, and uh, Terry Ives' sister opens the door, and she's basically they explain why they're there, and she says, "You can come in if you want, but uh, uh, you know, if you want her to tell you anything, you're five years too late." And she is, they go in, she's like borderline catatonic, you know, like a little responsive, like sees them there, but doesn't actually, um, it doesn't actually say anything. Yeah, she's not like a total vegetable you know she there's some kind of facial expression and mannerisms but overall unresponsive um you know and catatonic and she's not really giving any kind of information um and so he's just trying to figure out like what the connection with brenner is yeah Um, i mean well and joyce is you know talking all about will's disappearance and yeah sheriff is talking about jane wants to know what the relationship with brenner is yeah, and, and eventually they kind of land on, um, Ive's sister is mentioning that she was a druggie, Terry was, and that she would get a few hundred bucks for doing these um, LSD experiments, which, interestingly enough, they did have government-run LSD experiments Oh yeah, this, like, throughout this the 60s. This is legit a real thing. I don't know if they were necessarily put in these isolation tanks, well, they, um, they, but definitely yeah. people doing LSD and being monitored. Yeah, and they've had both types of studies, like, legit through the government. I don't know how much of them, like, actually crossed together, but they were doing all kinds of crazy stuff in the 60s, and the movie Altered States is basically about... Um, you know, isolation take experiments, but combining with drugs and it not being the best circumstance. So, you know, I, I always like these alternate takes on history, like, you know, things that really happen, but they take them to the umpteenth level and now there's a kid with superpowers. Like, I'm all about that. Yeah, well, I mean, they, they were just trying to kind of expand the boundaries of the mind and 
Uh, they say that, she, you know, they didn't know that she was pregnant. And if that's the case, you know, shame on them for not doing their due diligence. But, or maybe they did realize that and that was part of the reason why they'd chosen her. Um, but she certainly didn't know she was pregnant at the time. Mm-hmm. And then Joyce at this point asks, like, if, if you had any pictures of the kid. And she's, and Terry Ives' sister is like, you don't understand, uh, Terry miscarried in the third trimester and... So that's when they go up to what would have been Jane or Eleven's room. Mm-hmm. So she thinks, you know, there is no kid that's ever been raised or anything else. Um, and so they go through there and start exploring. And, um, you know, they, they talk, you know, you now get a flashback, right? Um, well, yeah, you get, um, yeah, well, yeah, what leads to the flashback is the sister says um, that, uh, you know that the child was born with abilities that's what terry has told the sister so she's kind of like okay that's what she's it was. saying all this like semi-sarcastically really because that's, that's where i got lost is that if she wasn't born then how did she have powers but it's all kind of been what her sister said who she hasn't she kind of takes with a grain of salt you know yes i mean because she was on all these drugs at the time so she you know tends to believe the other story where a sheriff uh, is dead set on that this is a conspiracy. Um, but yeah, she basically, uh, the flashback you're talking about is of Eleven killing those attendants, uh, the, the ones that were trying to throw her back in the cell where she slams the one to the wall and does like the little like twitch of her neck to the side that uh, yeah. that makes the guy's neck snap. She's full on badass mode and that's kind of overlaid by her talking about telepathy, telekinesis, um, and you know her baby a being used as a weapon. Commies. Yes, exactly. So that, that's kind of the, the the scene that stuck out to me most. Um, so anyway, she she says the doctor said that she miscarried, and she obviously is comfortable and, and sound in that opinion. But Chief, with all he's seen, um, this is just another piece to his puzzle. Yeah. So um, then we kind of uh, switch gears, and uh, we're with Mike. He's in his basement. Uh, Eleven is not there. He's pissed off just kicking this big old comforter repeatedly and uh dustin rides up to mike's house and the two of them are talking in the basement and mike is kind of uh definitely regretting that he yelled at 11 and is blaming lucas for it and dustin saying it wasn't his fault it was all their faults they were all being assholes and dustin was the only reasonable one which is true i mean he definitely gets props for that wouldn't you say Yes, I will say that he was the only reasonable one because um, both Lucas and Mike were being pretty hot-headed, and then they get into you know kind of you know brotherhood's honor type thing, but uh-huh. in D and D speak, and at the, yeah, at the end of the day, uh, Mike drew first blood, uh, which means he needs he to be the bigger man, yeah, and and shake hands and kind yeah, of, obey or be banished from the party. Yes, so they decided to, to set out and go find Lucas and make amends, even though Mike kind of begrudgingly is doing so. Yeah, and it's uh, you say setting out. I mean, Lucas lives next door to Mike, so it's not like... Uh, Everything's an adventure when you're eight. <laughs> you, you know what? I'll, I'll give you that one. All right, uh, thanks. That's true. So they, uh, Dustin and Mike end up uh, uh, going on their grand adventure to Lucas's house. Um, it lasts about four seconds from the walk <laughs> from the basement door to uh, Lucas's front door, but... Um, Lucas is like, what do you want? And uh, Mike's like, you know, I drew first blood and kind of like begrudgingly extends his hand. And uh, they walk in and Dustin's in the living room pacing. He's like, okay, I'll shake on one condition. We forget the weirdo and go straight to the gate, which leads to more arguing. Uh, Oh, yeah. Sorry. Lucas says that. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah. So he's not quite like it's a weird cut because he extends his hand and then you just see Lucas pacing. But uh, Lucas isn't willing to shake yet. And uh, they, they don't come to an agreement there. They don't because uh, they just continue arguing. And this is when Dustin, definitely Dustin, mm-hmm. uh, says, uh, do you remember what happened on the Bloodstone path? We split up and the trolls kicked all our asses. Uh, you know, this is the and then Dustin is saying, like, this is the party in this room. Elle is a liar. She's a traitor. And Mike's like, uh, you know, she didn't mean to hurt you. And, uh, and Dustin's Luke, like, it was fucking awesome. Yeah. Like, just yeah, admit exactly. it. I know like, you're butt hurt that you got, I could have been killed. And Dustin, yeah, it was awesome. <laughs> yeah, he's like, I know you're butt hurt. You're thrown into a car. You got knocked out. You, you never trusted 11 to begin with, but 
we have a girl with powers on our side. She is a weapon, um, but Lucas still is not sold. So he is going to use some kind of compass contraption to find the gate while they are going to go ahead and set out on their path. Oh, yeah. He pushes right past them. So now we know we're going to get a, a whole split party adventure here. It's it's definitely going to be like the Bloodstone path all over again. <laughs> yeah. They're going to get picked off one by one and have their asses kicked. Now, I will say Lucas at this point, I think, is drawn first blood because that wasn't just like he walked past them. He straight up pushed. Definitely. So he's drawn, I guess, would this be second blood? Yes, yeah, Second Blood, which I swear is a John Claude Van Damme movie. <laughs> uh, okay, let's let's link that bitch up. <laughs> if uh, it is, yeah. <laughs> um, so right here we get another Eleven flashback. Uh, she wakes up clutching a teddy bear, and Papa walks in, uh, hands her a flower, and says, "Today is a special day. Today we make history. Today we make contact." And then he gives her like a little boop on the nose. And uh, this is when she wakes up present time uh, in the forest, dirty as shit, and walks down to the stream with her wig off and uh, it just throws it on real quick to look at her reflection. She's having a little bit of a moment. She pulls it off and is just staring at herself in the water and getting all worked up. And she screams really loud and like the water just kind of the surface of it just explodes outward and all the birds in the trees fly away. And this is when you get her again just dirty as shit walking up to the grocery store yeah now before we get to the grocery store that last scene um although it wasn't a very long one um had a lot of emphasis for me because i've kind of been wondering the whole time l has these powers it's related to mo the monster but what is the connection and this is the first line that kind of seems like the whole time they knew there's monsters and beasts on the other side and that they're using uh, 11 and maybe these other subjects to make contact as opposed to they're exploring just powers that they're aware of and then they inadvertently run into a monster and try to harness it this seems very much like we're actively pursuing uh this creature we found out about which definitely uh, this is yeah this has been murky the first time that uh, because last episode was the first time with that we even in the flashbacks uh, see the monster at all mm -hmm. and uh, and this is the first time that like you said that it has become a point of emphasis for the scientists at Hawkins laboratory yeah so now she's in the grocery store uh, she looks like shit she's Drawing in, a lot of attention yeah because she's dressed as the girl from the uh, one of the previous montages in the show but she doesn't have the wig on so she's standing out as a girl with a shaved head um, but also that she's just super dirty um so she enters there there's another little flashback yes. at this point um uh well i'll let you tell it i'm sorry i interrupted well no i mean it's he's leading her through the room going to the deprivation chamber um and he's saying ignore all the scientists and it's just an interplay yes, but papa. yes yes papa but it's it's an interplay between the mentality she's taking in the grocery store she's ignoring That's all the exactly people staring right. at her and then it's cutting to all the scientists staring at her and uh, ultimately, she's like, let go my egos, you know what I'm saying? God damn it. That is literally exactly what I was going to use. You I love that we both... Material. No, I mean, I have the same exact note. I love that we both saw let go my ego. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so she, she calls... Um, well, first off, the manager uh, says, son, are you lost? Uh, which yeah. I thought was kind of funny, because remember back in the beginning, we weren't totally sure during the first scene whether or not she was a boy or a girl, or at least I didn't. But she calls him a mouth breather, grabs a shitload of Echo waffles, <laughs> and uh, the manager tells the associate to call the police, and um, uh, Eleven just, she doesn't run, she doesn't jog, but she just walks out with serious purpose, and the manager's following her. She uses her mind powers to make this uh, shopping cart get in his way, at one that a lady was holding on to, so she's kind of like stumbling behind it. Yeah. And then she walks out of the, the grocery store, and he's about to follow, but she slams the glass doors shut. Like, like the automatic doors, shatter. like the slam shut, and the yeah. shatter, similar to um, the effect that Tulip had with her pink flamingo from the Preacher episode we just did. Oh, good call. Cross-promotion. Cross promotion. Right. Synergy. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Uh, where, where were we? That synergy uh, kind of threw that, me off. Yeah, that was a yeah, yeah good synergy when it completely <laughs> just out fucking did not your game. The exact opposite like, of synergy. What were we doing right again? Uh, <laughs> oh uh, man, uh, professionals. <laughs> um, so the the next scene that it gets to, um, it, and it's just a real small one, but I wanted to go through it because. Do you remember the agent that was at Benny's who was pretending to be Child Protective Services that ends up... Yeah, the silver-haired lady with exactly. the silencer. Yes, mm-hmm. uh, the, she kind of looks like Jane Lynch, by the way. Yes, she does, actually. Yeah. Um, well, she shows up at Mr. Clark's house uh, pretending to be part of an AV club association that connects kids from all over the state with like-minded individuals and wants to know if he has any kids in mind that would be interested and uh, obviously, she's angling towards uh, getting more information or more connections with uh, Mike, Will, and Dustin. Yeah, she she does remind me of like a mix between Jane Lynch and Glenn Close. Yeah, yeah, I could definitely see that. And by the way, I just said Mike, Will, and Dustin. I meant Mike, Will, Dustin, and Lucas. Yes, Mike, Will, Dustin. Yeah, that's all of them. Yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, we've got a uh, Dustin. Uh, no, again, not Dustin. God damn it, Lucas gearing up. <laughs> um, he's throwing on his little bandana. He's got his bag packed, uh, and he grabs his bike. And as he's kind of wheeling it down his driveway, he looks over and sees uh, the Hawkins uh, power van uh, there across the street. Gives him even a little wave, not knowing what's going on. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and they wave takes- back. They're perfectly. You know, they're not acting suspicious. We just know they're suspicious. Yes, um, and then he takes off on his bike, uh, ends up pulling up to the fence at Hawkins Laboratory, and uh, he, it just stretches in both directions, uh, yep. basically as far as he can see from there. And he's like, I, I, I guess this, yeah, I have to go this around. It's going to be a bitch. Yeah. And if, if I could say, we did get a little mini montage from Lucas, which is pretty sweet because he has a utility belt like Batman, and he has a camo bandana. Right? Yeah, he does. Yeah, he he was looking super fly. Yeah, dressed to the nines as far as you know, eight year old detectives go. Yes. <laughs> um, so uh, so Mike and Dustin are riding their bikes and they're having a conversation about what's transpired with Lucas and Dustin, who is very clearly the the wise, level headed one out of them, says, uh, you know, Lucas is jealous. Um, he's your best friend, right? You know, I get it. I didn't get here till the fourth grade, and you guys are right next door to each other. Yeah, but Mike now- does not want to admit, like, well, no, I, I like all of you. He doesn't want to, despite the differences they're having, he's kind of in an awkward position because he doesn't want to admit to, you know, uh, Dustin that Lucas is the best friend. Yeah, and I mean, maybe he doesn't really feel that way because by the end, it seems like he convinces uh, Dustin that that's not the case. Um, but, you know, Dustin says, now that Eleven's here, uh, he feels kind of displaced, um, and, uh, every, you know, everybody's acting like goblins with intelligence scores of zero. That's not my line, by the way. That that was his line. Like, I took that right out of the show. Well, it, it played flat both times. <laughs> God, I fucking hate you. <laughs> <laughs> Worst improv partner ever over here. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so <laughs> Mike says, uh, you know, you're all my best friends, including you. I, I think that they have like a like a little um, butterfly kiss moment here. And yeah, then, they, they slap each other in the ass and say good game. Uh-huh, yeah. I, uh, yeah, they were definitely sick in the paint. <laughs> um, and so at this point they see like a big old fucking hole of blue going on at the grocery store. Uh, yeah, so they now are kind of crossing into the scene that we saw earlier where um, Eleven is leaving. She has all the egos she could ever possibly want, but uh, everyone's kind of perturbed because there's glass everywhere. A woman had a shopping cart pulled from her, so they're not sure what the hell is going on. No, they're not. And uh, at another store across town, Jonathan and Nancy uh, are grabbing all these different supplies <laughs> to trap the uh the old monster and the guy at the counter is like wondering what they're doing he even asks like you know what are you using all this for? yeah because there's two giant mm-hmm. bear traps but then there's all these like um i don't know giant i, I think they're actually nine inch nails oh, okay like yeah. you saw those that they threw up there plus all the other stuff so it definitely looks suspicious i mean if you're a cashier and you see a kid check out with two things of toilet paper you like you already assume, uh, assume they're going to be suspicious toilet what toilet paper you already assume they're going to be suspicious but to have this level of stuff they're up to no good 
Mm-hmm. They're gonna kill someone and hide the Start body. Start making trouble in the neighborhood. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. <laughs> but uh, so yeah, she says uh, monster hunting. That's what they're up to, and he kind of chortles a little bit. And so they walk outside and load the stuff in, and she's like, "You said turtle wrong." Wait, what? He said turtle wrong. <laughs> I said he kind of chortled. <laughs> <laughs> do I need to explain to you what chortling is? Yes, please do. Asshole? Is that a Pokemon? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta catch him all. Pokemon! Um, <laughs> so, anyway, uh, she is saying, like, man, what a difference between last week and this week. <clears throat> last week, you know, I was shopping for clothes to impress old rape face. And now I'm here getting hunting supplies with Jonathan. Yeah, he's like, uh, I I spent a whole weekend shopping for a top that Steve would like. mm Mm-hmm. Which you're like, God, you're pathetic. Yeah, sounding a little vapid. But, you know, she is is growing into a more powerful character, I guess, throughout the thing. Yeah. I I don't know if that's the word, but... (laughs) Powerful is not the word, but she's coming into her own. Yeah, she is. Uh, So... As they're talking, somebody uh, drives by, honks, and yells, uh, uh, can't wait to see your movie, Nancy. Woo, woo, woo. And she's like, wait, what? And she that doesn't goes storming down the road and stops across the street from the movie theater. And somebody has defaced the sign up on the marquee that now says, uh, starring Nancy the Slut Wheeler. Yeah, which uh, she's like teary-eyed, not crying, but on the verge of crying um jonathan is chasing after her. she's obviously pretty pissed off um but luckily the, the culprits are pretty easy to find they're right around the alley and it's uh rape face harrington tommy and uh casadega so it's gonna be something different every time yeah until we figure it out all right um so yeah she goes up to them and nancy just fucking smacks him right across the face and he's like, what's wrong with you? I was worried about you. And uh, the, um, god damn, what are we calling her again? Uh, Carmen. Okay, so Carmen says, you know, you don't want to be known as the lying slut. Um, and Nancy's like, y- you know, uh, you don't know what, you, you know, you don't know what you saw. Nothing happened. Um, and he's like, I want to know what happened. Gets all up in her face. Yeah, he's all up in her face. He wants to know some information. She obviously can't explain it because, you know, it has to do with fucking monsters from another dimension and going into the vagina holes in a tree, and that's not going to play well. And the last thing she wants to hear is Tommy and Chrysanthemum keep laughing and chuckling at her. <laughs> uh, yes. So uh, so uh, basically Jonathan's like, come on, Nancy, let's get out of here. So they start walking away, but... Steve is not done. So he's pushing Jonathan as they're walking away. He's like, you know, you're all a bunch of screw-ups, your whole family. Uh, I'm not even surprised what happened to your brother. I'm sorry to be the one that, you know, to tell it to you, but, you know, you're all losers, and that's why this happened. So they... Yeah, there's a lot of of tension building there, and you can tell uh, Jonathan is just, like, bubbling, and you're not sure... he's fighting the urge at first. Yeah, you're not sure if he's going to do something or not. You really don't know. And then all of a sudden... <laughs> oh, God. That was the weakest punch. So, uh, let me, let me try punch, too. Oh, my God. That was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to have to turn the volume way off. I now, might have to. I can, I can barely hear whatever is going on over there. Jesus Christ. Please, somebody buy something off one of these links. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but anyway, so they're sitting there going. I, I will say this: this fight. I mean, outside of his initial sucker punch, it was pretty. It was pretty funny. Have you ever seen the movie They Live? Uh, no. It's it's a John Carpenter movie. You know, he did the thing in Halloween, and this show definitely has a feel. But it's known for having the longest fight scene ever, and it's uh, rowdy or Rodney Piper, the wrestler. Uh, right, and this other Piper. act, yeah, and they fight for like eight minutes. And if you've ever seen the Cripple Fight episode of South Park, it's literally shot for shot doing the They Live fight scene. And <laughs> it's a lot of just like roughhousing on the ground without any contact being made. And that's kind of what this fight reminded me of. That's awesome. I, I'll have to check that out at some point. Um, but I will say, Jonathan eventually does get the the better of old rape face and ends up landing a couple of decent blows before the deputies end up pulling up. Um, and Jonathan, in his blind rage, 
kind of sh- lunges out at them as they're separating them and ends up punching the one deputy. They get him in handcuffs, you know, over the police cruiser and rape facing crew end up uh, making their grand getaway. Yeah, so they escape. Jonathan's in custody. Uh, and, you know, it just doesn't seem fair. No, definitely not. And uh, at the same time that this is going on, Joyce and the sheriff are leaving the Ives house. And in the car, Joyce just looks so defeated. Uh, sheriff's like, come on, you know, we're closed. We'll find him. Joyce is like, it's been 12 years and she hasn't found, uh, you know, her kids. So wh- mm-hmm. what do I have here? And Sheriff's like, but there's a chance. Do you know what I would give for a chance? And that, that was kind of like a, a sad, poignant moment. Yeah, because, you know, his, his daughter is dead. There's at least a chance for Will. Um, but you know, she obviously doesn't feel that optimistic with what Terry has been going through. But then the radio breaks out. Yeah, not a lot of time to sit here and stew about it. Yeah, and the radio breaks out. He doesn't have time for it because it's just about a fight. Uh, but then he's like, well, aren't you with Joyce? It's it's Jonathan Byers. And so then it Yeah, we got him here cuts. at the station. Yeah, so they have to go to the station and deal with her son and all of this. Okay, um, what was the name of the dispatch lady? Flo? Was it Flo? Because I wrote Marge here, and, and I thought to myself, Marge isn't right. I probably shouldn't say it out loud on the podcast, which I'm now doing. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go with Flo. Okay, so Nancy's talking to Flo at the station, and Flo's like um, uh, something along the lines of uh, you know calling her... Uh, calling her and Jonathan boyfriend and girlfriend. She's like, oh, no, you know, we're not that. And she's like, honey. No, you wait, better tell him that. I don't know why she's a sassy black lady all of a sudden. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, you better tell him that, you know, because only love makes you do stupid shit like this. Can, since you were going to call her Marge anyway, can I hear you say that as Marge from The Simpsons? Uh, honey. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> It sounded like a dying cat. It hurt my throat so bad, too. I need a sip of water. Oh, my goodness. You did sound like Marge. You sounded like Marge's uh, smoking, chain-smoking sisters. <laughs> Selma? Yeah. Or Thelma and... Uh, shit, I can't Thelma and Louise, right? That's definitely not it. It's just another thing we could link to, though. Mm. Damn, that was really bad. Oh, Ooh, man, that was so, so funny. Um. <laughs> okay, so... um. Anyway, so she goes over and uh, puts some ice on Jonathan's little head, and I don't know why I said little head. <laughs> goes over and puts ice on Jonathan's head, and you know he's cuffed, and uh, they just have like this brief little exchange, but not super important. But that's pretty much it for that scene, right? Like nothing else important happens here. Yeah, no, that that was it. Um, but now we see what is a pretty sweet, like I don't know, cover for. A Bear Grylls collection. It's just Elle in the wilderness eating Eggo waffles. Yeah, she's really woofed him down, too. Great um, composition, but she has, like, boxes around her. She's definitely been hungry. Yeah, do you think that she ate them frozen? Or do you think she allowed them to thaw first? Um, I don't think they've really shown us the, the other power she has, which is pyrokinesis. So she probably cooked them in real time. All right, I... I much prefer that to the image that I had when I first saw her eating it of like I've like, heard us like ow, frozen waffle ow, yeah, exactly. crunch like, ow. She, like she smiles because she's really enjoying it but her teeth are all broken <laughs> yeah yeah so um, we'll, we'll say so, that didn't happen she hears Mike yelling for her at this point and so then you cut to seeing Mike and Dustin walking through the woods yelling for her. Um, they hear something so they get quiet real quick and all of a sudden, the bully starts striding up over this hill towards them. And uh, the one the one who, you know, whizzed his pants at the assembly uh, has a knife. And so they start running from him. And the music's swelling. It's getting intense. Um, uh, at the same moment, Lucas is walking around the fence and uh, at Hawkins Laboratory, realizes this is the spot uh, right on the other side of the fence. So he climbs a tree, gets out the old binoculars and sees Hawkins Laboratory and a bunch of vans, which I might add, they have the same logo as the one at his house, so he probably realizes, I think, at this point, that the van that was outside of his house is uh, from this place, so they've been... I I don't know if he's putting all this together, because they don't tell you that, Mm -hmm. but since they've shown this and they took the time to show the van outside the house, I'm thinking he has the presence of mind to realize, like, 
oh shit, they've actually been scoping out my neighborhood. Like maybe maybe me personally. Yeah, they don't they don't confirm it, but we should know soon enough if uh, he's been paying enough attention to realize just how deep this is going and maybe that the right approach has been the one that uh, Dustin and Mike have been taking all along. Yeah, not getting the authorities involved. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, back to Mike and DJ Dustin. McP- DJ McPisspants. That's what I call him. <laughs> I love that you had to restart that too. <laughs> really uh, took all of the and, out of it. And, and then uh, Doofy McDouche. <laughs> okay. Because nice. the other one's like doughy and dumb and like, you know, where's, you know, yeah, go on. Uh, <laughs> man, that was a mega swing and a miss. I I cannot wait to go back and sample <laughs> that and make it my ringtone. You. <laughs> but you laugh and that you're my audience right now. Oh, fuck. You're right. I, I You know what? I should start leaving you hanging like you do for me whenever <laughs> I fuck up. I, I can't wait for the episode where you somehow prepare a soundboard and actually play a cricket sound. That's gotta happen i'm honestly (laughs) going to do that as soon as foreshadowing yeah all right right. exactly um so mike and dustin get pincered and they're right up uh along one of the like the lips that go up over the quarry and um so they grab rocks and they're they're throwing them but my god they are not sick in the paint they miss by like (laughs) 15 fucking feet dustin goes over and swings wildly inaccurately at the one bully who ends up putting him in kind of like a a headlock with his knife right up at his throat and uh you know he wants to know how like how did you do it how did you make me dj p pants myself in front of the entire assembly and and, and dustin uh, is willing to actually give you know, give up the ghost and actually tell him how it happens, but it's so outlandish. He's like, our friend has superpowers, and she squeezed your tiny bladder, to which he just puts the knife closer to Dustin's face. Yeah, and then he's like, okay, fine. Mike, wet yourself. Jump. And, you know, this is where uh, basically you kind of realize, like, they're up at the top of the quarry and uh, says he's going to cut Dustin right now, you know, He's taken to the dentist's office or whatever. Dustin's begging Mike not to do it. It's no, it's not worth it. Like, mm-hmm. um, and so Mike walks over to the edge, and the camera comes up over him, and then shows you basically like the scale of how high up they are here. And I'm a little bit queasy around heights, and I have to say that like this was like a like put my hand on the armrest sort of <laughs> moment. Like, oh my god, like that is. That is legitimately high up. There was a moment when he was uh, kind of going over the arrangements of, of not having your friend die. And I thought he just was going to have uh, Mike piss himself, to which is like, oh. That- Definitely, yeah. He yeah. says, wet yourself. Yeah, and then I immediately just thought of any time um, I've ever had to do, like, you know, blood work or whatever, uh, or do stuff, and you have to pee, and you never can. And I was like, oh, man, how terrible would it be if you just had no piss to give to save your friend's life? But then it got a lot worse because he had to jump off a cliff. Um, I think that having to pee myself on command would be almost impossible with the shy bladder. There's no chance that I could muster that up. Yeah, I I don't know how you do it. You'd have to have, um, I don't know the name, Doofy McDouche. Is that the name I gave him? You'd have to have him just squeeze Mike's bladder. I think, like you said, like you'd really have to already kind of go. You know what? Let's let's not even do this right now. Can we <laughs> just move on from this? Like before we go any further down this, like let's get ourselves out of it, like right now before we've like overcommitted. Yeah, I think if anything, we'll get an expert on biology on, and they can talk about like the urinary tract and those things, and then we'll <laughs> splice that into our episode. Oh my god, I wish you just had like a, a zipper sound right now of us of us zipping that up. Is that, do you have that on the soundboard? Uh, I don't. I mean, I have, I have um, a duck quack. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> I love how loud quiet they are. <laughs> Can you put it closer to the fucking mic? I, I just realized I had my, my phone turned down, but it's like... <laughs> there, there you it go. It doesn't even sound like a quack either no, way. It doesn't. Not oh, even a man. Bit. What I'm going to say, though, is that with all the laughs we've had, the audience has to be. 
<laughs> what are they doing? They're spilling a bag full of quarters. I don't. I don't know what that's. What They're just was. throwing their money at us because the value. Oh, okay, gotcha. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Oh, okay. Well, please, we've got to move on. This is horrible. I can't. I can't do this anymore. Okay, so. Whew, um. Dustin is screaming, don't do it. The, the, even the other bully at this point <clears throat> is losing his nerve. Uh, and the main bully just starts counting down, you know, five, four, three, two, one. And Mike steps off the edge. And, the, you know, all the kids immediately let go of each other and run over to see what's going on. And Dustin says, holy shit. And uh, Mike stops, not even halfway, like, I don't know. Maybe 30 feet down? Yeah, 30 feet down, midair, and you're like, oh, fuck, Eleven got finished with her meal. Oh, and then yeah. the camera changes, and Eleven just looks super pissed. Um, and she's still the way she's walking dirty, up, like, looks badass. badass. Just, like, she is a, a woman on a mission. Children of the corn. Yeah, very much children of the corn. Uh, and, and she presents herself, and... Uh, Dustin now, just smiles. I loved it. Yeah, Dustin is smiling ear to ear. And now you think DJ McPisspants might believe those things he said about uh, their friend having superpowers. Oh, yeah, because uh, she immediately uses her powers, knocks the bigger bully down, and then does that awesome little head twitch thing that just snaps the main bully's arm. Oh, uh, yeah. And it's broken. And, uh, and so they go running off, and Dustin's like, She's our friend, and she's crazy. She'll kill you, sons of bitches, if you come back here. You hear me? She'll kill you. And when, she's, and when he's screaming that, it sounded so much to me like the hyena is yelling at Simba when he's running away during that one scene. Do you remember uh, that? Vaguely. I, like As you impersonated it, all I thought about was um, Donnie's wife from Preacher going, You son bitch, Preacher! <laughs> you get that son bitch! Yeah. Uh, yeah, I vaguely remember that scene from Lion King. That was the first movie I ever cried in, though. Um, okay, you want to tell us about that? Uh, no, I just thought it was, was sad when his father died. That was sad. All of this, everything the light touches, is our kingdom. <laughs> you can tell you have young kids. <laughs> I could seriously do every single line from from every Disney movie first off, but especially Lion King. Yeah, I it's... know that your powers of retention are as wet as a warthog's backside. <laughs> right. if, you, if you go any further, I think we have to pay like substantial rates. <laughs> yeah, that's so right. let's stop. At least change up the melody. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so at this point, L falls. Like she's obviously kind of like overextended herself a little bit right here, and we get the ultimate flashback, which is her going back into the dark area and seeing the monster at a distance. Yes, yeah, she sees the monster. Um, she's terrified. She then, you know, basically proclaims that she's the monster, in which Mike is like, "No, no, you saved me." So, you don't know what the connection is there. I think you're just kind of going back to where Lucas said she's the monster, and she's just feeling guilty about having these powers and maybe not always using them the right way or just killing people in self-defense. But I'm curious to see more of how the monster and her correlate. Yeah, I mean, uh, <clears throat> during this part where she ends up touching it, um, the, this is where like the the walls outside of uh, outside of her chamber start like cracking really badly, and uh, and the scientists are all running around like crazy, um, and, and it's all because her you know her touching this monster has ripped some fabric in time and space that has opened a portal between our dimension and the shadow dimension. Yeah, I mean, it's it's all implied, but that contact, like Papa said earlier, like you're going to make contact, and then the physical touching seemed to make this rift. Um, and whether that's what did it, or maybe it's just that now it's aware that there's a whole other dimension to play in, like you don't know, but you, you definitely get the feeling that this is where it all started to unravel. Oh, yeah. So now they're back to the present, and Elle is like, Mike, I'm sorry, the gate, I opened it. I'm the monster. And he's like, no, you're not the monster. You saved me. And then Mike hugs her, and then Dustin gets in on the action, three-way hug style, best friends forever. The camera kind of pulls back off of them, and then they're walking their bikes back over towards Mike's house. Mm-hmm. And now we see... Uh 
the man of the Hawkins power truck. He's radioing someone and he has eyes on them. So between um, the woman that was pretending she was from Child Protective Services, these guys we've seen around, like all forces are starting to coalesce on these kids. They are the focal point. Yes. And uh, so they get, you know, get back to the house and basically... Um, they go walking through the door. The music's kind of swelling. Uh, Eleven closes the door behind her and cut to black. That's the end of the episode. Shit's about to get real, if you ask me. Oh my god, I can't, cannot wait. I mean, the the only downside to covering the this podcast the way that we've done is that everybody I know is already done with Stranger Things, and I'm the one fucking putz who hasn't got to finish it yet. And I'm just... <laughs> And I'm so into it, you know. I am we're too. putting so much effort into into doing this that I'm watching every episode multiple times. Just like cannot fucking wait to record so yeah. that I can go and see the next episode. And uh, I'm just dying to see where this all goes. Yeah, I am as well. But I definitely think there's a a, a charm to the glee we get to approach every episode with because we really don't know what's going to happen for the most part. Um, and it's just yeah we're not putting this on for the audience like this no, is, like I, this is legitimate I, I truly have not seen episode seven as of the point of, that this is being recorded yeah and, and neither have i i would love to but i'm, I'm holding off because i think it's it's fun for us to kind of get lost in what could happen what's going to be um answered what isn't going to be answered um and i will just throw this out there it took so much restraint to not play the, the soundboard I had that was called five four three two one when you started to count down. <laughs> that would have really thrown me for a loop. Uh, Although just, it would have been so quiet, I wouldn't have heard it. Over my <laughs> no, but anyway. just the fact of all the samples it doesn't have, like it doesn't have the typical record scratch, like the it just has a, a countdown. Um, but I knew we laughed too much. We had too good of a time this episode. We had to save some for the next ones. Yeah, that's a good point. I'm not sure if I'm going to listen back to this one and have a good old time laughing. Or if I'm going to be, like, fucking humiliated and never want to record after midnight again. <laughs> it definitely got borderline hallucinatory, that's for sure. I mean, we, I think we may have actually crossed. When I started singing Disney's children's song. <laughs> I think what may have happened is we actually entered the other dimension. Maybe oh, we're making God, contact. Oh, dimension? Mm-hmm. Yeah, pretty much. That's what this feels like. But... Anyway, um, let's go ahead and put a bow on this bitch. Uh, Thank you very much to everybody for listening, as always. And you'll be happy to know we are going to be wrapping this up this week. Uh, So episodes 7 and 8 will be released by, I mean, what do you think? Probably Sunday at the absolute latest, uh, maybe even as early as Saturday. I don't like absolutes, but that sounds like a decent timeline. Okay, so absolute 100% Mothman Mathis guarantee uh, Sunday that both will be out. And I, I swear uh, my life on it. <laughs> uh, and I, as always, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Reddit. As we're nearing the last two episodes, if there's anything you want to throw out there, anything that you'd like to see us cover, um, uh, we had a great suggestion. Mathis, do you want to give our shout out to, uh, to US TV Addict? Oh, yes, that's right. We shouted them out on uh, the Preacher podcast, which I don't believe they listen to. Uh, but it's US underscore TV underscore addict. Uh, they are a fan that, that follow our stuff and offer recommendations. Um, and we will probably be doing some like awards at the end of the season just you know about our favorite characters and, favorite and different scenes. moments. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, which I think is a good way to, to wrap it up. We did that. That was a great idea. Yeah, we, we did it with Preacher. It worked really yep. well. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, the one other thing I would add is not only uh, rate us on iTunes if you haven't already, but um, just take the time to tell someone about it, right? I mean, maybe be one of the few people that stands out right now and have a non-political post on, on Facebook or Twitter and just advertising a podcast you like because that would do us a lot of good. Uh, and we love doing this every week. So uh, yeah. we will see you next time, little buddies. Yeah.